stop trying so hard to love him and let him love you. Yeah. So often we're so fixated on like what I can do or what I'm doing wrong. And we're so obsessed with those things that we're, we're just incapable of just being receptive and letting him love us because that's really what's going to transform us and unite us to God. Yeah. And our woundedness and our shame respected to our sins, you know, there can be this, this uh, unwillingness to, to see ourselves as loved by God because of, of um, mistakes that we've made or, or wounds that we've experienced. And um, a lot of people in the world today have a hard time understanding that God loves them. And uh, the solution to that is to, to let God love you because yeah. that'll, that'll heal all things. Praise be Jesus Christ, and welcome back to another episode of CarmelCast. CarmelCast is a production of the Institute of Carmelite Studies Publications. For more information, you can visit our website at www.icspublications.org. My name is Father Pier Giorgio of Christ the King, and I'm joined today by Brother John Mary of Jesus Crucified. Welcome, brother. This season, we're talking all about the life and the spirituality of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. And um, in this episode in particular, we're going to be focusing in on kind of a a rather on maybe to most to some people an unlikely aspect of her spirituality and it's her apostolic spirit you know we think of apostolic saints and we think of the apostles maybe yeah. <laughs> and um, what's interesting is within the Carmelite charism there is this uh, this strong emphasis on the apostolate not just for the friars who Saint Teresa of Avila our founder is created to kind of be at the service of the nuns but also to be working in the apostolate but even if you consider like the foundation day of, of St. Teresa's first monastery at San Jose in Avila, she chose the feast day of an apostle. And I think that was intentional to, to sort of show that to, the, the work of, of a contemplative nun, the work of a contemplative religious is the work of the apostolate. Yeah, and it might surprise people, like you said, that, you know, here's this saint of where we talk about what she's really well known for is like silence, her teachings on silence and an interior recollection. And yet... Um, she is an apostle, and she has this this very strong apostolic spirit, which um, is important because I think one of the most important aspects of her teaching for us today is that she has a spirituality that is um, relates to all people. She has a very strong lay spirituality, mm -hmm. and so the fact that she has this apostolate, this apostolic spirit within her life, um, within her spirituality, means that that her teachings also on prayer and on the interior life um, can also relate to people in, in the world. Yeah, and not unlike probably many of the people who are watching or listening, she had, she had the heart of a mother. Mm. She had the heart of a teacher. And um, this, didn't, this didn't get subsumed or, or, or destroyed upon receiving the veil and entering the cloister. You know, her motherliness, uh, her, her, her desire to teach and to share the fruits that she herself was receiving continued and, and even strengthened, I think, upon, upon receiving um, the habit and, and entering into the vocation that God had called her into. So let's kind of get into the beginning stages of, of kind of the seeds of, of, of St. Elizabeth's apostolic heart. Um, and it comes from a period in her life that we've already spoken about, I think last week, uh, with respect to the time when she was this postulant outside the walls. So she had been accepted for formation but spent two years um, kind of a as, a, as a representative of, of the Carmelites, but still living at home, um, but also intentionally um, beginning the work of her own religious formation. And uh, it's interesting how um, the prioress at the time of the Carmel of Dijon, she was uh, very supportive of, of Elizabeth and the other young women who were going to be entering, some of them who didn't end up entering, of uh, making sure that they were, were being part of the church in the midst of their postulancy. Um, and this took the form in many different ways. Most of all, I think within the con context of her parish community and, and serving most especially the poor in her parish community. Um, we know that she would, she would, she had a, um, a gift for sewing. She would make and repair clothes to be sold in the kind of the parish charity shop to be sold, uh, to, to provide for the poor. She would, um, meet the poor, um, go on visits to people who were shut-ins, um, people who were um, very sick, um, 
and and also working to uh, she, there was this kind of youth club that was really interesting. She uh, she helped out for a um, to kind of provide a, a place for for young people whose parents were involved in kind of industrial work. There was a tobacco factory in town, and she provided for some of the the I don't know you could call it like after school care type of thing. That's the analogy that I would use today for for the the children of these mainly women who are rolling cigarettes for their jobs in, in the tobacco factory. Yeah, we just see really the, the wisdom of the prioress of, of the Carmel, Mother Germain here, but also the, the wisdom of the, the apostolic spirit of Carmel to begin with, and that, you know, how can we prepare these young women to come live lives of contemplative prayer uh, in, in the monastery? We wouldn't maybe think right away like, oh, well, let's send them out on mission to the poor, uh, to their parishes, going door to door, like seeking out those who haven't haven't um, received their catechism classes, like that just seems almost counterintuitive to us. But but the privates was able to see that no, this is really the preparation to have an apostolic spirit uh, in prayer and in Carmel. That this was the, the first step that was needed was for them to be involved in these things. And I'd say Elizabeth um, took to it very um, very eagerly, but also she had a great gift for this kind of work because she was so relation relational and um, just yeah, person oriented, I think. So there's great stories of um, often they would, you know, go together. So she would like visit the, the sick with another young young woman who's planning to enter uh, Carmel. And so there's stories of like, uh, there's one story where she, they went and visited this man who had been like paralyzed basically and bedridden and just the experience that they, the two of them had there. The woman she was with was an older, she was an older vocation. And I don't know if she was, you know, how old she was, but she was older than Elizabeth. And she, she shares that, uh, you know, Elizabeth was obviously struck by this encounter with this man who had, I think he was bedridden for several, I mean, I think it was 17 years or something like that. Um, and, and on that first visit, she, she didn't say much. And this other, this other girl, this other woman who Elizabeth was with noticed that. And so when they were making their rounds the next, maybe in a few days later, the next week, um, the older woman maybe said, well, maybe this had too much of an effect on Elizabeth. She wasn't quite ready for that sort of situation. Um, and Elizabeth demanded, she said, no, I want, I want to see that man again. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it was at that point that she was able to muster up the courage to, to speak to him about, about God and about suffering, whereas before she felt insufficient in that sense. Right. Oh, and I imagine, I mean, she was only you know, 18, 19 years old, here she is approaching this man who's been paralyzed for 17 years. And Most trying, of her life. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And trying to, to share with him. Uh, but that's what Elizabeth is. She had this great ability to go inside of her, in this interiority, to enter inside of herself. And so um, she was able to almost touch the, the, the other, the other person, the, uh, the, the suffering one or whatever it might be. And, and that experience of the other became a part of who she was mm -hmm. such that when they they left visiting this man, it's like she would be visibly like look ill, not because she was so bothered by the situation, but because she'd really had this incredible ability to enter into the reality of mm -hmm. the other, meet them there and bring uh, Jesus there. Right. Yeah. That, that idea of sharing in one's passion, that compassion, right? And, yes. Right. And that, that being an important aspect. I think it's interesting what strikes me most about this period is that I, I think for many people, maybe... Um, would see this this stage, this opportunity, if they were going through it as sort of red tape or a hurdle that they had to get across in order to get to what they really wanted, which was, um, you know, in this situation to live in, in the cloister and pray and have a contemplative vocation. But Elizabeth didn't see it that way. And she was she was heroic in her ability to really em embrace this this as something that was no different from, um, you know, not, not something that she just had to do as a way to, to like fill the time before she could enter, but as something that was integral to her own formation as a as a contemplative religious yeah and it'll be interesting to see how much of a division she even saw between this time before carmel and this time after that's something that we've talked about in the last episode too is how uh, elizabeth's time waiting to enter carmel uh became this uh this great it was, it was an opportunity for her to learn that the realities of her vocation could be lived here and now um, it wasn't just waiting for something else. It was like, no, everything can be lived now interiorly. Mm -hmm. And so that's what she was able to do here too. It wasn't so such that when she entered, there's like becomes hardly even this distinction. There's just this uh, fluidity between the two, which um, relates very much to her spiritual teaching on heaven too, is like her, her whole teaching was that we can live the realities of heaven here and now through faith such that when we die, there's 
even this very little of this transition. It's like we're already living it now, um, almost in its fullness. Yeah, it's it's interesting too with with respect to this whole period because, um, you know, she she had such a strong identity in what her vocation was, and she knew where she was called. And there was this there was this instance of they were. They were doing something, and there was a religious sister involved, um, and she had made the comment that, "Oh, this 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 is a young woman who is clearly destined for, for religious life." And of course, the sister was thinking of maybe as a as a sister, as an apostolic, doing apostolic work. And um, Elizabeth replied to her that, uh, "Well, actually, I'm I'm going to be entering the Carmelites." And and um, surprised that this was where she was going, the the sister said, "You know, I would think of you more of as as a sister than a nun." And uh, Elizabeth replies, "I'm made for the interior life." Yes, yeah. <laughs> and so it's it's to say that um, we can we can have this identity. We can be made for one. We can be we can be made as as Marys in the midst of of you know a kind of a Martha type of life. And that doesn't change who we are. It doesn't mean that we've missed something in our life. It just means that um, it's 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 um, I think accidental. The, what we do is accidental to to who we're with mm-hmm. in those moments. Yeah, it's it's not even so much about uh, about what we do and who we're with as is it really is about who we are, who we are interiorly in our souls. That's what really what our vocation is about. Right, right. And uh, we can feel like we maybe missed maybe something. Maybe we feel like oh, I I should have been a nun or I should have maybe not me personally, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'd make an ugly nun. I should have been a priest. I should have been a nun, and um, and to kind of despair in that because of of the sense of missed vocation and it's. It's it's um, you know the the indwelling of the Trinity within the human person, the baptized person, is is what makes the identity of the person. That's that's our first identity. It's being an adopted son, adopted daughter of the Father. Mm-hmm. Um, one more sort of anecdote with respect to this time was this young this young girl Louise de Molin. She was a um, fourteen year old girl who was uh, from a irreligious family. And uh, she was, the parish uh, had asked her to prepare this young woman for sacraments of initiation. Um, and, and I think we have some of, her, of this young girl's testimony about, about who Elizabeth was and her impression of her. And one of the things that struck this girl who was just coming into her faith, was just receiving the sacraments, was the witness of, of a recollected life that Elizabeth led. No matter where they went, uh, together, whether they were going to some talk for the for the the candidates for baptism or confirmation, or whether they were walking in the streets, there was this sense that she took from her of recollection, no matter what. Um, and I think that speaks again to this to this idea of you don't have to be in the cloister in a contemplative vocation in order to live a life of of recollection, even amongst the errands or the trivial trivialities of life. Well, and I think especially of our secular order Carmelites, our, our third order Carmelites, how much, um, how much opportunity there is to bring this spirit of recollection into the world and those that they encounter. Like really what uh, Luis was saying about Elizabeth is what I hope that, that you know, people in the workplaces would say about our secular Carmelites too, is that there's just something about them, uh, something about their, even if, even if a person is coming from a totally irreligious setting they don't even can't even necessarily put words to what it is but there's just something different recollected like they they have this peace about them and and that's a beautiful the beauty of that vocation is that they can then bring this to the world the other thing that louise uh, states about elizabeth is that when she found out that she was going to be entering into the into the cloister into the carmel of dijon um, she relates that elizabeth promised her that she would be closer to her than ever uh, within within the the bounds of the cloister and um, and so this this apostolate ultimately would transform into something different, which would be uh, different but the same the apostolate of prayer. Yes, yeah. So once Elizabeth finally does enter into the convent and um, you know begins her life there in Carmel, it's it's very interesting to see how again there's no not like this um, this gap for her or this like disjoint just disjointedness it's just like this 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 flow that continues like what she was doing before is continuing after the fact Mm -hmm. yeah and so and so within this this um like how how does a carmelite understand understand prayer as an apostolate yeah i think that i mean uh starting from the beginnings of our saints uh you know the carmelites on on uh mount carmel 
that there was this, this spirit where um, prayer became the primary apostolate. And that's something that continues through the time of, of St. Teresa of Avila to our time today. Even us as friars, right, we have an active apostolate. Um, you know, we're ministering to those in the world, and yet uh, our primary apostolate to the world is our, our apostolate of prayer. And I think there's, this, there's also this important aspect that I think we always have to remind ourselves about with respect to prayer versus apostolate or, or contemplation versus active, an active life or, you know, the Martha versus Mary sort of dichotomies that we kind of set up in our hair, head as a way to kind of uh, organize our, our understanding of these things. And, um, you know, various spiritual authors throughout the history of the church have kind of touched on this, but it's something that Elizabeth herself understood and picked up. And it's the idea that you can't really do one without the other. Um, there, there isn't a dichotomy. There, one flows from the other, and the other flows into into the first. You know, it's this, it's this, um, it's a false dichotomy. They're yes. they're they're one. They're it's a both and sort of sort of aspect. The dichotomy is within ourselves. Right. Um, and and holiness is uh, a matter of of shrinking that dichotomy until it eventually disappears. And that's what you see in the life of the saints, and I think particularly in the life of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and in of course in Jesus Christ Himself, who is always united to the, the, the Father um, in his very being. Yeah. We're going to talk about some of the letters that she wrote to seminarians, but I want to read from one of those letters in, with respect to this idea mm. um, of, of the false dichotomy or the, the need for, for this to be maybe thought about or, or thinking about it to be corrected uh, continually. She writes, I think this is to, um, to um, Andre Chevignard, the, a seminarian, uh, in letter 191. She says, since our Lord dwells in our souls, his prayer belongs to us, and I wish to live in communion with it unceasingly, keeping myself like a little vase at the source, at the fountain of life, so that later I can communicate it to souls by letting its floods of infinite charity overflow. Mm -hmm. And so this, it's this idea of, of, of you know, I, I, I fill my cup to, to pour it out upon, upon those in need in charity and in love. Yeah, and that, that outpouring um, in some sense comes through, you know, the, the, the letters that Elizabeth would write or, you know, the meetings that she'd have with, with her family and friends. But, but more than that, it's just an outpouring in prayer of like giving, um, giving those people their, their struggles, their, their pains and sufferings, like giving those to God and letting God uh, pour out his grace upon them in, in a spiritual matter way. We have this to kind of go in the other direction of the of the di of the false dichotomy. We also have this understanding that um, the measure of our holiness, uh, what is what is how do we measure someone's holiness? Um, and it's it's not in how much how many hours they spend kneeling. It's not in in um, in in how hard it is to disturb them when they're praying. It's not in these sort of um, appearances but rather in in the charity of the person mm -hmm. and so this is this is an important uh, element to to kind of thinking about um the contemplative and and the measure of their holiness is also within this this these acts of charity within the context of where they are right and and that gets to the core of what is it that unites these these two and it's love yeah um love is the common the common, not even just the common factor between the two, but it's actually what encompass, encompasses the, the two of them. Um, love is 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 the the mean or the the focus here of this this reality of um, the apostolic spirit, whether that's lived are being lived out in the moment in a time of prayer or in a time of of um, work. Yeah. Yeah, and because we have a God who is a un a union of a union of persons in love. Um, we have we have uh, a God who is love, and who can't who who then who then pours forth His love on the world. Yes. And and so this is this is you can't get more contemplative than the Trinity. Yeah. <laughs> and yet and yet and, and also it, more active. <laughs> and yeah, also. You and can't so get more it's, active, yeah. it's it's this it's this sense of of um, you know we would just look to God and what He has done. He has created us. He has created us for Himself, so that we can love Him mm -hmm. and and uh, and to share His love. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, all this is to say that really what Elizabeth felt drawn to and, and was responding to was this call um, to, to, to be 
um, well, similar to Therese, to be love in the heart of the church, but to do so particularly through her prayer, through prayer for her family, through prayer for her friends. Um, and then also something else that Elizabeth was kind of awakened to shortly after entering, entering Carmel was the idea of prayer for, prayer for priests. Mm-hmm. And this is something that was very um, very at the core of the Carmelite vocation from the time of Teresa of Avila. I mean, she, she really saw that as essential to the vocation. But we know that this struck Elizabeth because she copied out a passage from it from the, when she was reading the story of a soul. There was something that Therese wrote there about prayer for priests, and Elizabeth copied that out into her journal. So it was something that struck her and this kind of new awareness in her that this was a part of her, um, her vocation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so she would, um, she would be constantly praying about for priests and for their vocation. Um, there would be priests coming to the, to the Carmel so that she would be introduced to maybe priests she had never known before. She had a close relationship with some of the priests in her life before Carmel as well. And so this, this, um, this apostolate for prayer for priests would have kind of been something that would have been very important to her because of the priests in her life. Right, and there was even a, a, a shift there where um, one of the priests that she knew from before Carmel, she had in the past, you know, always asked him to pray for her. You know, that was his vocation. He's a priest. And yet uh, her first letter to him when she entered Carmel was assuring him that she would be praying for him. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, maybe it seems very natural to to say that, but there's this kind of boldness in that, in her saying that to this, you know, priest who had known her since she was little, um, she's taking on this spiritual responsibility now for for his vocation, uh, for his ministry. Yeah. And we know that St. Teresa had a strong, a strong sense of the sort of the charismatic nature of the church and that it goes both ways. And so you always, you always see in her letters, particularly to priests, to, of her reminding them to pray for her. Yeah. And so it's this, it's this union of, of charisms in the church to, to uh, be building each other up right. in the midst of, of whatever vocation we have. Yeah. Yeah, and this... Um, I thought that I had connected to something that you said earlier when you were reading from that, that letter that Elizabeth wrote. Um, it seemed like Therese saw her, her vocation, her, her apostolate to prayer as one which would then overflow out of her. Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, yeah, overflow out of her um, in, in, onto other souls and then into the world. And in a similar, another ter- um, image that she would use at times is one of a, a flame, of a fire. You know, God is this burning flame, and uh, we have to be ignited by that flame such that then we share that fire, that heat with others. Um, but she really understood that it was in her prayer was, was the, the primary place where she would be filled with God so that this kind of radiating, uh, this overflowing can take place such that once again we're saying that the the prayer the apostolate of prayer is for her just not it's not disconnected from the the apostolic life and spirit that she was called to mm-hmm. she had an, she had this understanding this theological understanding of of um that would be come it becomes really strong in in something we'll talk about later um one of the treatises that she would write uh, heaven and faith um but it's something that you see in her letters even now uh this idea of remain Mm-hmm. Remain in my love, the, the words of our Lord to the apostles at the Last Supper in the Gospel of St. John. Um, but this is something that happens, that is, that is coming again and again. Um, uh, she, says, she says to, to, Ab, to Abbe, um, or, sorry, to the seminarian Andre Chevignard, um, be an apostle who remains always at the spring of living waters. Um, she says in that letter that I, I quoted earlier, keeping myself like a, vis- like a little vase at the source. And so she has this understanding that, that you know, in writing to these seminarians or priests, that, um, that one needs to remain with God. Um, and it, it's, it's something that I think is, is, uh, is essential to, to her understanding uh, of the apostolate. No matter what you're doing, we can always remain with God. Well, and it kind of breaks down, once again, our false dichotomies, because I think we can think, well, prayer is that thing I have to go to to be filled. That way then I can go out and do my other things in my life. Right. And she's like... No, there is no, there's no leaving that, that place, that source. It's, you're always there, mm-hmm. um, whether you're in prayer or whether you're um, at work or whether you're, you're recreating, whatever it is, you're always um, interiorly, you can remain in that place being filled by God and then overflowing on, right. onto others. 
And it's not to say that this is, you know, obvious or easy. It's it's a it's a remaining in faith. It's something. I mean, we're so we're so sensory oriented, and we, um, which is why so many people have little reminders of God's presence with them always. You know, whether you keep something in your pocket to remind you that God's with you, um, or you have you have images of uh, you know Christian images, holy images around your house, so you never forget about God's presence. Um, you know, those are tools to help us, but but ultimately, it's it's a it's a it's an exercise in faith and mm. in, in acknowledging that even though I'm not even thinking actively about God or I'm not even, you know, maybe actively praying that God is with me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's, there's, um, you've already mentioned some of these letters, but there's a whole series of letters, uh, that Elizabeth wrote to, uh, seminarians. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's interesting because there's a parallel here with the life of St. Therese. Therese also had these missionaries that she was writing to, um, but we can see in Elizabeth, once again, this just total unity that she saw between what they were doing um, in becoming priests and what she was doing. And actually, I mean, her words are just, they're really pretty strong. Um, and then she says, you know, uh, well, I want to be an apostle with you uh, from the depths of my dear solitude in Carmel. She just saw that that's, yeah, she, she, could, she, could, she could live the life, she could live the same ministry as their their priestly ministry within the context of Carmel. She said in another letter, apostle, Carmelite, it is all one. Mm-hmm. So there's just not this distinction in, in her, um, for her, um, but rather, and, and a lot of this comes, you know, even uh, we, we see this emphasized in the theology of the Second Vatican Council of the priesthood of every, every, every believer, you know, through, bapt- through baptism, um, we have this, this priestly calling, mm-hmm. um, this this calling that we can live out whether we're ordained as a priest or not. And Elizabeth, so solid, you know, she, she resonated with that calling within her to, to make holy, uh, to live the life of a priest um, in, in her own way. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's an interesting, you know, yeah, that sense of the baptismal priesthood within all of us. And that would become something that, that she would, she would, um, um, develop even further on towards the end of her life uh, when in her later letters that she would write to, to some of the people that she loved and um, it, it's a it's a powerful reminder for all of us that um, that uh, we need we need to bring uh, like the priests of the Old Testament like what a, what a priest does today bring sacrifice um, mm-hmm. bring bring the sacrifices uh, that we make and that other people are making on on behalf of, of whatever they're suffering or whatever is going on in their life that is not ideal, bring those to God so that he can sanctify them. That is the role of a priest, to, to, sanct- to, to bring to God to sanctify. And mm-hmm. so um, in that sense, uh, why not have a, a share in, in the priesthood of our ministerial priests who are doing so much for us and bringing um, you know, sanctification to the world? Yeah. I want to talk about one, um, one incident, one kind of interesting anecdote that, that has to deal with... with um, the priests and seminarians that she she would write to, um, and it, it happens. It's an incident that occurs um, in the in the spring of 1904. Um, at the time, we've we've alluded to this before, but in France there was this anti-clericalism, and there was even this move to close all of the Catholic schools and only have public schools. Um, and so the French government had proposed this, and the French bishops, in sort of a retaliatory stance, wrote a, a, a letter sort of denouncing this and, and calling to mind the, the dangers of this and why it doesn't make sense. And all the bishops of France signed this letter except for one, and it was the Bishop of Dijon, uh, Monseigneur Le Nordet. Um, and this caused a lot of scandal within the context of the city of Dijon. And uh, it wasn't something that would have been lost on Elizabeth either because of um, Mother Germaine, the prioress, her brother was kind of actively involved in kind of calling to question the intentions of this bishop and uh, led this group in, in that sense. And and the bishop was kind of taking that out on Mother Germaine. She, he was kind of harassing her in many ways. Mother Germaine says that, um, that uh, nothing kept her up at night more than this man, <laughs> mm. this bishop, uh, who, was, who was really harassing her. Um, in the midst of all of that worry, Mother Germain receives a letter from a young priest, a newly ordained priest. And we don't know the, the circumstances of why he wrote to the Carmel, but he was looking for, um, he wanted to talk to a, to write to a nun um, and, and to, to speak to a nun and to maybe receive some inspiration. And um, 
The letter that, that um, Elizabeth writes to this young priest is, is extraordinary. Um, she knows of everything that's going on, um, and she, she writes this to him. This is, this is from letter uh, one, um, 193 to Abbe Gelet. May he lift you up in the light of faith to his heights, where one lives only by peace, love, union, made radiant by the rays of, divine, of the divine sun. Recently, someone wrote this beautiful thought to me. Faith is the face-to-face with darkness. And then she writes, remain in my love. Um, remain, speaking of, uh, of, he had the incarnate word says to us, remain in my love, she writes to him. And so in the midst of, of you know, difficulties within the context of, of uh, politics or the church, Elizabeth, in this letter to this young priest, doesn't even address kind of that drama. Um, and it was in, in the seminary in Andre, um, Chevignard would also be experiencing a lot of this, this turmoil as well, personally, as a seminarian. Um, and Elizabeth's message to this is, remain with God. Um, and so in the apostolate, we ought to remain with God, but also in the midst of our anxieties, our worries, our worldly worry, worries that have a, do have an effect on us and, and do cause turmoil in our hearts, that, that the, there's only one thing that's necessary, and it's to remain with God. Yeah, just to keep your eyes on Jesus. I think that's, that's really what's essential here. That, that's Elizabeth's message, um, and it's so relevant to our times, too, where there you know, can be so many things politically in our world or in our church even that can consume us. Um, I think we spend so much of our time worrying and being concerned about the things that uh, ultimately we, we don't have any say in. Mm-hmm. Um, when we, yeah, when those are the things that we can just hand over to the Lord and, and keep our eyes on Him instead. Yeah, yeah. And if we fill, we fill our, our silence and our time with, with um, all of these anxieties and worries, we're really, we're really doing the devil a favor and keeping our eyes away from God or, or losing hope that God, He's got this. You know, yeah. this is the... This is this is his world. We're living in it, and and come what may, uh, he wants to be with us. Right, and and of course, you know, none of the saints would have seen this as saying that we should be apathetic in the say, right. face of injustice or anything like that. Um, but if by turning to Jesus, then we would know too when we ought to act, if we ought to act mm-hmm. um, in a particular situation. So when we do experience injustice, still the the message is to turn to him. Uh, keep our eyes fixed on him. But I, yeah, I think so often we, we are um, distracted and bothered and, and not at peace because of these things that are outside of our, our realm to even begin in any practical way to change mm-hmm. when really we need to be, um, you know, like Our Lady who went to uh, Jesus at the um, wedding feast at Cana and just say, like, they have no wine. Like, give the problem to, to Jesus and just let it be. Yeah, and and do whatever he tells you. <laughs> and then do it. And then do whatever he tells you. <laughs> yes. Um, speaking about more of these these letters, maybe not to the seminarians. I don't know. Do you have anything else you wanted to bring up from that? Just again, seeing that that unity where the the I feel like the priests are writing to her because they feel like she has something as this contemplative that they can't have, and she's just saying like, no, we're we're the we have the same right. the same calling interiorly as apostle. As contemplative nun. Yeah, yeah, and just a reminder uh, for us to take seriously our, our that all of us have a contemplative call, no matter yes. what we're engaged in. Exactly. Within the relations of of uh, her family, there was um, this this young family that um, Elizabeth was close to, um, the Desordon family. Um, Elizabeth was closer to the old, the older daughter. Uh, they were closer in age, but there was the young, the younger daughter, the sister of her friend, um, um, was F- Francois, Francois de Sourdain. and uh, Elizabeth loved her for very, very much. But more than Elizabeth loved her, um, Francois idolized Elizabeth, and and was was devastated. I think would be the would be not an exaggeration mm-hmm. when when Elizabeth entered entered the Carmel. Um, St. Elizabeth, I think, saw something of herself in, in Francois. Um, Francois, uh, I think she had a temper like, like Elizabeth did. Um, and so for whatever reason, the prioress gave Elizabeth permission to continue to write to, to Francois 
uh, Francoise, um, even even after uh, even when she was a novice and in, in entering the Carmel. Um, there's one letter in, in particular that I wanted to read that comes from from this time when um, when when Francois Francoise was being I don't know overly dramatic with respect to to um, having lost Elizabeth forever. Um, and, and her response to her is, is revealing um, because, because uh, she has to be strong with her. She has to be direct with her. And she says, I see uh, my friend Bois, my friend Bois, this was her nickname for her, my little raspberry, she called her. Um, I see my friend Bois has hardly been converted. This certainly grieves me. In the past, I overlooked these fits of temper, but now you're no longer a baby and these scenes are ridiculous. I know that you'll allow your Sabbath, that was her nickname for herself, Elizabeth. I know that you'll allow your Sabbath anything, so I'm telling you what I think. You absolutely must get to work on this. See, you see, my darling, you have my nature. I know what you can do. Ah, uh, if you knew how good it is to love God and to give him what he asks, especially when that costs, you wouldn't hesitate for so long to listen to me. Um... And so, in this, in the sort of childishness um, of of her, of the of the younger sister of her friend, um, Elizabeth is even able to be direct and and to and to help her to come to a better understanding of what she needs to be doing, and and where where Elizabeth wants to see her moving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also see in this relationship, um, once Elizabeth entered Carmel, there, be, there's almost a transition that happened here too as well, where before she was almost like an older sister to her, mm -hmm. and then. Uh, now she begins to take on more of a motherly uh, spirit in regard to her, or and also the spirit of a teacher. And that's something that we see coming out very strongly in Elizabeth's letters from this time in Carmel is suddenly she's she's becoming this teacher of, of prayer, this teacher of suffering, this teacher of holiness to these people that she's writing to. Yeah. Yeah, and it would be something that would extend to, to the members of her family too, to, to Geet, her, Marguerite, her, older, her younger sister, Rather, um, would be going through changes of her own. She would she would get married. Um, she would she would have children. To, uh, I think two daughters, right, in the midst of of, of uh, uh, while Elizabeth was still living in Carmel. And Geet took took Elizabeth's entering into the Carmel. I think harder than Elizabeth anticipated. Um, mm -hmm. It was kind of a, a surprise to Elizabeth that her sister became so distraught at, at having lost her sister because. Geet was so supportive of Elizabeth in the midst of, of all of that, the, the turmoil we spoke about last week. And she says, Oh, my darling, when, you, when you're sad, tell him, the one who knows everything, who understands everything, and who is the guest of your soul, realize that he is within you, as in a little host. He loves his little Geet so much. I am telling you for him. During the day, sometimes think of him who lives in you and who so thirsts to be loved. It is close to him that you will always find me. And then she says, she gives her even some practical advice, kind of uh, speaking of that, that kind of uh, role as teacher for, for Geats. I would advise you to simplify all your reading and fill yourself a little less. You will see that this is much better. Take your crucifix. Look, listen. You know our rendezvous is there. And don't be troubled when you are occupied like you are now and can't do all of your exercises, all of your prayers. You can pray to God while working. It's enough to think of him. Then all becomes sweet and easy because you're not working alone since Jesus is there. So this whole sense of, of again, um, remaining with God and, and this being kind of the message of her apostolate, remain with God always, no matter what you're doing. And this is, this is the essence of, of that, that apost apostolic spirit towards a, towards a lay spirituality of contemplation. Mm -hmm. uh, the biographer, Joanne Mosley, points out an irony here that I, I really like. She's talking about, you know, we were saying some of the, the difficulties between the church and the government at this time. Um, and some of the laws then began to, you know, exile some of the religious. And it was interesting because they were going particularly after the active religious, so those who were teaching in schools or working in hospitals. Um, they were forced to close their communities and, uh, and leave the country. But it's interesting because uh, here's Elizabeth, and she is taking on this very active, active apostolate of being a teacher and um, consoling the sick in the morning. Um, but she's doing it within the confines of the, the convent. And so 
Uh, Joanne Mosley just points out how beautiful that this this apostolic spirit, you know, did so much good for the church. Um, and because it was rooted in this contemplative life, it was able to to continue on in the midst of this persecution. Yeah. So there's so many letters from this period that kind of speak of what we're talking about. But I think the the one of the more important um, pieces of writing that, uh, that that Elizabeth wrote with respect to this this sense of apostolic spirit would be a treatise that she wrote uh, for her sister Geet at the end of her life when she was when she was sick in, in the infirmary and dying. Um, and Geet wouldn't even come to know of it in, until I think four or five months later after Elizabeth's death that she would actually receive this. And, and Elizabeth pours her her whole uh, this whole sense of, of of her understanding of her of her role as an apostle, as a teacher, as a mother, to to her sister Geet. And the the treatise is called Heaven and Faith. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's written in the, in the, in the kind of in the style of a, of a typical Carmelite 10 day retreat, um, where you have a, a morning meditation and an evening meditation, uh, to, to follow along over the course of your retreat. Um, and it's, it's really a beautiful, it's a beautiful sort of, um, uh, we speak of the, of a floralagia. It's just this um, this old word that refers to kind of a bringing together all of these different sources into a very like a beautiful like picking flowers and arranging them in a beautiful in a beautiful arrangement into a vase. And it, that's that's really what a lot of Elizabeth's more uh, I guess prose writing you could say is is kind of characterizes. Uh, she's bringing in she's bringing in all sorts of saints between the Holy Holy Father Saint John of the Cross between the the Flemish mystic uh, John Roycebrook. Um, and and just sort of uh, building together all of these these pieces and and, and creating um, something that that we'll talk about I think in a future episode creating from these sources uh, a house in which to dwell uh, spiritually it's this is what I think um, maybe Elizabeth's understanding of spirituality is it's it's building a house with which to dwell with God in um, and and so um, have, heaven and faith is is that building up. Uh, for for Geats, it's building up a, a spirituality for her sister as sort of her last gift to her sister. Yeah, and it, it really is an interesting work because it again it's in the style of written in the style of a retreat, and so this was the beginning of of August, shortly before the first two weeks of August, shortly before Elizabeth d- would die in November. So those first two weeks she wrote this work, and then the next two weeks she wrote the other major prose work, which we'll talk about I think in probably the last episode of this season. Uh, Elizabeth's last retreat. But the two works are actually very different because um, the one, the second one, the last retreat was actually, Elizabeth was on a retreat and she's, you know, it's more of like her own experience. She's writing more of her her own reality. Um, Whereas Heaven and Faith is this retreat, which it wasn't a retreat that she was taking, but she's writing these reflections for her sister. Um, Her sister, who is a mother who's living in the world, uh, is in a very different place than she is. So even though the two were written, you know, right after one another, we can see, um, a, you know, see the difference between them. And so it really, Heaven and Faith is is a work that I find just extraordinary because it can relate to, it, it's Elizabeth taking her spirituality and making it accessible um, to those who live outside of the, the cloister. And, and having in mind the accessibility for someone in particular who was very busy with, with, with young children. Right. Yeah. And, and what's, what stands out? Well, first of all, maybe I'd give some advice if someone were, were to read this because it's found in the, the first volume of um, the first volume of the complete works of Elizabeth of the Trinity. And I think when I first set out to read it, I don't know, I, I, I didn't do it correctly. I think I just tried to like read through it. Like you're reading like a, I don't know, any other book. Um, but it's something that is really meant to be prayed with such that you almost need to take each of their reflections, read it very slowly and sit with it in prayer. Because if you just try to read through it, it's just so heavy as far as like these quotes from St. Paul and it's so all these concepts and I think it's going to be very difficult. But if you really just take, you know, a period of prayer and sit with one of the reflections and, and sit with it for quite a while, then I think that's when you'll appreciate it more. Yeah. Um... Father Conrad de Meester, who is the editor, the French editor of the Complete Works of Elizabeth, says that it has the complexity of a symphony, mm. um, and and that's an ap- appropriate sort of analogy to her being a musician and, yeah. and constructing this this kind of spiritual symphony, mm-hmm. um, and, and with all the complexity of of that kind of genre of music, um, yeah. and and having um, 
you know, uh, themes that are that are kind of present and being replayed in, in various points within the the exposition of, of the retreat. Yeah. And I think maybe what what stood out to me most um, when I first read it is, um, again, this is connected to just Elizabeth's lace understanding of lay spirituality is that she's calling her sister um, again, her sister who's married and has kids and is living in the world. She's calling her to the heights of contemplation and saying that, that this is attainable for her. And she doesn't like shy away from that. Elizabeth does not shy away from that at all. She just, just lays it out. Like, this is what you're called to. This is the reality that you're called to. And so, you know, anyone can read this work and Elizabeth speaking to us too and saying the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. It's very dependent on, it has the kind of this priestly nature as well, because it's, it follows, um, it, it follows throughout the retreat, the, the writings of the, of the evangelist St. John in the, in the, the last discourses of our Lord. Um, you know, the retreat begins with this quote from St. John, Father, I will that where I am, they also whom you have given me may be with me in order that they may behold my glory, which you have given me because you have loved me before the creation of the world. And then, you know, later on, uh, remain in me. And so this, mm -hmm. this theme, of, again, of remaining, um, the Greek word menine, it, it has this, um, obviously for, for Elizabeth, it was probably translated in her Bible as remain. But, it, uh, you know, different English translations might translate it as abide, uh, abide with me, um, or, or, or stay with me, or, or dwell with me. It has all of these, the same sense, uh, different senses of the word within that one Greek word, menine. Um, and so this, this whole idea of remaining, I love this quote, remain permanently, habitually, remain in me, pray in me, adore in me, love in me, suffer in me, work and act in me, remain in me so that you may be able to encounter anyone or anything, penetrate further still into these depths. And this is at the very beginning of the retreat. Right. She just <laughs> di she's diving right into the heights of, of the the spiritual life and, yeah. and saying that this is what our sister's called to. And this is also where the name comes from of the, of the, the, the work because Elizabeth herself didn't give it a name, um, but it's called today heaven and faith. And that's because it's really this, um, it's almost a manual on, on how to live the life of heaven here and now, which uh, Elizabeth believes is totally possible. And to say that it, it means, you know, to live this call that Elizabeth says to be a praise of glory. Um, to, to live in union with God, to live totally in union with God here and now on earth, no matter what our situation might be. What's fascinating for me is that she's running at a time where she doesn't have to wait much longer to, yeah. to live that, that, the full reality of heaven. She's, on her, she's dying. Mm. Um, and yet she must have some inclination that her sister would live a long life. And of course, she lived a normal life of, of, uh, to an older age. Um, and and so the her insistence and, and this idea of heaven and faith of living that heaven is something that is that is attainable in faith here and now and and that really our our even our existence um, our, our our eternity with God is 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 occurring in not a sensible faculty mm -hmm. uh, until the resurrection of the body but rather within this this sort of um, this existence in faith right yeah and and faith is really the the heart of it all right this is how we live. Um, heaven here and now. This is how we live in union with God here and now. And um, to such an extent that um, through the eyes of faith, Elizabeth has this real sense that we can see every instant of our life as though it's a, a gift from God, as though it's God calling us or leading us. It's God speaking to us. So there's, I mean, one of her more famous quotes is from this work where she says, each incident each event, each suffering, as well as each joy, is a sacrament which gives God to the soul. So it no longer makes the distinction between these things. It surmounts them, goes beyond them, to rest in its master above all things. Well, so this whole idea of faith, it, 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 she's, she quotes from the letter to the Hebrews chapter 11, you know, faith is the substance of things hoped for. We hope for eternal life. This is the culmination of all of our hopes. And faith is, is literally in the Greek standing under our hope. Faith yeah. is, is the as the substance of things of things hoped for. So we're really it's all we have to 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 grasp. Saint um, Holy Father Saint John the Cross he says that that uh, faith is 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 an, is an obscure possession. Mm -hmm. It's it's something that we that we uh, attain and, and it's 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 what we can grasp at when we're when we're most struggling with um, with eternity and in the in the 
the ridiculousness of life on earth and mm-hmm. it's it's really all we have to hold on to and it's it's really uh, an important aspect that we have to live mm. yeah i like too how you pointed out that the fact that elizabeth is dying you know uh, very close to the end of her life here in the last few months um because it also shows i don't know i almost see um the saints in general are kind of this uh it's like they're so close to heaven that then they can awaken us to the realities. Um, they, they have this like insight into the life, the life of heaven, the life of God, well, the life of heaven, which is really, you know, participating in the life of the Trinity. They have this uh, insight into it that then they can then pass, pass down to us in a sense. But mm-hmm. Elizabeth here, especially because she's so close to this time of her death, it's like she has this, yeah, this incredible um, taste of, of heaven already. And she's able to not only then turn to, to her sister and turn to us and say, here's what heaven's like, but actually say, here's the reality that you're experiencing even here and now. Again, with, with um, not fully yet, we don't always experience, we don't always see, we don't always feel, um, but the reality is there. The, rea- the same reality of the most blessed Trinity, we, we participate in that through faith. One of my favorite themes in this in this um, retreat is is uh, just as we don't have to wait um, to live heaven to to live in heaven, uh, we don't we don't have to we don't have to wait to experience heaven on earth. Mm-hmm. We simultaneously don't have to wait to die to experience death. Mm-hmm. And this is the idea of dying, um, dying in this life, not just at the end of the life, but our life. And for Elizabeth, very she's close to death at this point. Um, but this it's this Pauline death. It's this death to the world. it's 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 dying to our attachments. it's it's um it, it goes hand in hand. you know if we if we want to live heaven on earth, we have to live death before dying. Yes, yeah, because death is that entryway into this uh, reality of heaven, whether that's the heaven of of um, after our early life or the heaven that we live in faith. Because I think I mean um, dying to to our to our um, attachments to the things that that uh, preoccupy us, um, the things that distract us, um, they this this is um, this is something that will ultimately strengthen our faith. And mm-hmm. this is this is clear if you watched last season. You know this whole idea of of detachment and 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 how that strengthens strengthens yeah. our eyes of faith. Yeah, maybe just to point out one last thing that comes at the end of Heaven and Faith is um, Elizabeth turns to Our Lady. Um, I think maybe we'll mention it in the last episode of this season, but uh, Elizabeth has this kind of reawakening to a, or maybe even a first time awakening to the importance of Our Lady in her spiritual life towards the end of her life. And she turns to Our Lady um, here as this example of, you know, the soul that's already living this reality of heaven uh, perfectly here and now. And I think Elizabeth begins to um, to see herself some in, in that role too, in, the, in the, the role of Our Lady as this spiritual mother. And that begins maybe a new phase of what we'd say of her. I mean, we see the beginnings of it unfolding throughout the years, but this new phase of her, um, her apostolic spirit in Carmel. Yeah. Well, she begins to call herself the mother of various people, including yeah. her own mother and in- yes. including her own prioress, you know, right. the people who she called mother. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, great. She's writing to her, her mother and she call- she says, I am the little mama of your soul. <laughs> and she says something very similar to her sister. Um, and, and in some ways, even to her prioress, she says, she says, I will be your mother. I will be your mother now. She actually yeah. says that to, to mother Germaine. Okay. So she's yeah <laughs> insinuating this, this new, um, role that she's taking on of spiritual motherhood. I think this is particularly interesting because really all women are called to this vocation to be spiritual mothers. And and it seems to me um, that that's a vocation, you know, not only to to teach, uh, it's a vocation to console, it's a, a vocation to really empathize with the other. Um, but I think more than that, what Elizabeth shows us is that this is a vocation um, that, that comes with this feminine genius to really take the other into your soul and to, to hold them there, to bring them to God there in the midst of your soul, and then really to bear them forth uh, into the world. Yeah. She would write uh, another very important uh, work that, that comes not in her letters, but in the, into the first volume of, of her collected writings, this um, 
kind of last testament. It's not clear to me um, when Mother Germain actually read it, but it seems to be that it was after Elizabeth died. Uh, she had arranged it in such a way that Mother Germain would receive it after her death. Um, and, and it has this beautiful theme of, um, I think, uh, that we haven't really touched on with respect to her message of, of divine predilection. Um, so the whole theme of, of this writing is, is uh, in John's gospel, when, when the apostles are on the beach and, and our Lord appears to them, and our Lord asks St. Peter, do you love me more than these, referring to the other apostles. And uh, Elizabeth takes this, this biblical theme, this scriptural theme, and, and kind of turns it into, um, well, the phrase that she uses is, let yourself be loved, let yourself be loved by God. Um, and the idea here that I think is really important to the theme that we've been talking about with respect to, to living, uh, well, to Elizabeth's apostolic life, but also to be living a contemplative life in the midst of lots of busyness and worries and difficulties in life, is that God is more interested in you than he is in the drama or the scandal or the, um, the difficulties going on in the church. Not so that he's not interested in them, but he's, he's got them. He know, he, he's able to, to bring them to their end. And what he desires, the thing that he can't always control because of our freedom, uh, and he loves us so much that he gives us freedom, is, is uh, that we be loved by him, that we allow ourselves to be, to be loved. Let yourself be loved. And this idea of, of predilection, that, God, that God's love makes us good. And so if you want to be better, if you want to, be, if you want to have a more fulfilling life, then you need to let God love you because that's the only thing that will ultimately uh, increase your greatness, I guess you could say, within the context of your life on earth. Um, and so this is what she's sharing with, with Mother Germain, that amongst all of her worries, amongst all of the things that she has to deal with within the context of the leadership of the Carmel, her message to Mother Germain uh, from this motherly perspective is, is, is he's interested in you, mm. so let yourself be loved. And, and that's something, a message that our world right now really needs to hear too. I think that if, if we could allow ourselves to be loved by God, then it would fix all of our problems. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I, I often like to tell directories, this relates specifically to the time of prayer, but I think time outside of prayer too, it's, it's stop trying so hard to love him and let him love you. Yeah. So often we're so fixated on like what I can do or what I'm doing wrong. Um, and we're so obsessed with those things that we're, we're just incapable of just being receptive and letting him love us because that's really what's going to transform us and unite us to God. Yeah. Or in our, in our woundedness and our shame respect to, to our sins, you know, there can be this, this uh, unwillingness to, to see ourselves as loved by God because of, of um, mistakes that we've made or, or wounds that we've experienced. And um, a lot of people in the world today have a hard time understanding that God loves them. And uh, the solution to that is to, to let God love you because yeah. that'll, that'll heal all things. Yes. It, it makes all things good and new. Amen. Well, good. Well, we thank you for joining us for this episode uh, of CarmelCast, focusing on the, uh, the apostolate of St. Elizabeth the Trinity. And, and I hope that um, the main idea that you received from this episode is just the idea of, of how, uh, for St. Elizabeth, the contemplative life is not restricted to the cloister, but is something that God is inviting each of us to, to remain in Him, to dwell with Him, uh, no matter what our state in life, what we're doing, or where we go. So may God bless you.